It doesn't take much reading to conclude that sleep and dreams have always been important for poetry, and romantic poetry in particular might seem especially keen on the imaginative possibilities of sleep. John Keats, for instance, has an early poem called Sleep and Poetry, which lays the groundwork for poems like his later Ode to a Nightingale, with its concluding yet unconclusive questions. Was it a vision or a waking dream? And do I wake or sleep? Wordsworth's The Prelude includes dreams alongside memories that haunt dreams. Shelley's last major poem is an unfinished dream vision. Byron's apocalyptic darkness begins by announcing how I had a dream that was not all a dream. And the greatest romantic dream poem is by Coleridge, whose Kubla Khan carries the subtitle A Vision in a Dream. Even in poetry, dreams require sleep. It's here that Coleridge's dark parallel to Kubla Khan, the pains of sleep, can step into the foreground. For this is a poem not about sleeping, but about not sleeping, and about being wrenched out of sleep by sheer, and always unsleeping, terror. The presence in these verses of anguish and agony, the fiendish crowd, a trampling throng, wild or hateful objects, fantastic passions, and maddening brawl, along with shame and terror, certainly suggests something other than a lullaby. And yet Coleridge makes a formal decision, a decision that is about the rhythmic and rhyming framework within which the poem is going to operate, that might seem more fitted to quiet composure than convulsive horror. For the poet chooses to write in rhymed iambic tetrameters arranged for the most part in couplets. That is, these are lines built on a pattern of four rising beats. Ere on my bed my limbs I lay, it hath not been my use to pray with moving lips or bended knees. Obviously, we don't read it aloud quite like that, and Coleridge wouldn't intend us to do so, but this is the metrical template, so to speak, which he is going to employ. Once you have a basic shape for a poem's rhythm, variations can be meaningful, precisely because they can be felt as variations from a norm. If something is unexpected or goes wrong, if the heart beats fast or is briefly stopped, you can hear that. Take, for example, the comparatively regular and in its way comforting, even slightly sedative marking of time in Coleridge's first stanza with things that come later on. But silently, by slow degrees, my spirit I to love compose. In humble trust, mine eyelids close, or a sense o'er all my soul impressed, that I am weak, yet not unblessed, since in me, round me, everywhere, eternal strength and wisdom are. Now, compare that steady rhythmic pulse with things we hear happening in the long st second stanza. Deeds to be hid, which were not hid, which all confused I could not know, whether I suffered or I did, for all seemed guilt, remorse, or woe, my own or others, still the same life-stifling fear, soul-stifling shame. Yes, the template is still here all right, but it's being stretched almost to breaking point. 
As Coleridge knows, regular metre can prove unequal to impassioned voicing. For a line such as deeds to be hid which were not hid might exist in a strict tetrameter frame of deeds to be hid which were not hid, but what that frame is trying to contain is what the voice would actually say. Deeds to be hid which were not hid, or even at quite an extremity, deeds to be hid which were not hid. The accents of a horrified voice may be sternly forced into the tetrameter, but they seem ready to burst out from it. The other lines in this passage seem to show similar strain and tension, not least the last stress-packed, stress-racked verse. Life's stifling fear, soul's stifling shame. Dig into this and you might recover the frame, but it's a frame that's been pretty decisively broken up. Life's stifling fear, soul's stifling shame. Even life stifling itself seems to be self-smothering, as the stressed life is immediately covered by its rhyme of stife and stifling, without even the breathing space of an unstressed syllable between the two. For all of this, restful is hardly the word. No wonder Coleridge is finding sleep a challenge. Naturally enough, Comparisons with other poems by Coleridge might help us to see how this metrical model is being pushed deliberately a bit beyond its own capacity to contain things. Kubla Khan undoubtedly represents a different, different and here painfully out of reach example of the iambic, of the iambic tetrameter, but only for part of its length, since that poem's Visionary intensities are allowed by Coleridge to generate either shorter lines, down to the sunless sea, a trimeter, longer lines, for example, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense bearing tree, pentameters, not tetrameters, or patterns of lines, where quite distinct metrical effects are required in order to register the novelty of mystical visionary change. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves. Where was heard the mingled measure from the mountain and the caves? And these lines are themselves examples of a mingled measure. The first allows an extra syllable after its final iambic stress, the dome of pleasure, a feature which the technically minded sometimes call a feminine ending, as opposed to a masculine one, where the stress is the line's final syllable. In the other three lines, the meter actually changes gear from iambic to trochaic. That is, the pattern of unstressed stressed changes to stressed unstressed. Flow midway on the waves. Notice how this leaves the last syllable, the line's masculine ending, stranded. The same thing can be seen in the last line. From the fountain and the caves. The metrical stranding here can be called, if you're in a sufficiently technical mood, a catalectic line, though the need to do that, admittedly, is seldom exactly pressing. If it's a fully trochaic tetrameter we want, there's the third of these lines. Where was heard the mingled measure? So it's possible to be sure that Coleridge knew a lot about variation in the tetrameter, and when he put down the line Life stifling fear, soul stifling shame. He knew what his meter was doing. And 
since the first person voice is the focus of attention in the pains of sleep, not least what it was doing to himself. The nature of the nightmares that stalk Coleridge's second stanza, for all the vividness of presentation, is complicated. Beneath all the bad dreams is something declared to be personable, personal, that sense of intolerable wrong. We could talk, and for a long time, about what this means in personal terms for the poet, but again, if only for now, we could do worse than just listen. It's an iambic tetrameter, albeit one that scrapes through on a couple of technicalities. The sense has to be overpowering, so it almost overpowers the pattern at the start of the line. Placing emphasis on the first, not the second syllable, creates what's called a trochee, but it won't generate a trochaic line, such as from the fountain and the caves, if the next pair of syllables fall into iambic step with an unstressed, stressed arrangement. And so it is here. Sense of, stressed, unstressed, gets rhythmically corrected, as it were, by intol, unstressed, stressed. But for this correction to work smoothly, the second half of the line must go iambically also, without too much forcing. Can that happen when intol turns into intolerable? Maybe, if we go very slowly, sounding out each syllable, that's just doable. Sense of intolerable wrong. Yet yeah, we're not going to do that, are we? And nobody could. It's as though Coleridge's line can't tolerate intolerable and buckles under the effort to do so. Perhaps a final stanza then might offer comfort, might somehow usher in the restful regularity of breath and of thought that will enable a sleep unpained by such nightmares of the self. That's the hope anyway. Or come with suffering strange and wild, I wept as I had been a child, and having thus by tears subdued my anguish to a milder mood, such punishments, I said, were due to natures deeply stained with sin. The pulse is comparatively steady here, and it's no accident that Coleridge hears himself weeping as he imagines the crying of a child in a perfectly regular line, too. For Coleridge, the father of a six-year-old, as well as younger children when this poem was written, knew what it was to put a child to bed. Amongst other things, that would entail saying prayers, and there's surely one prayer or nursery rhyme-like prayer that haunts the pains of sleep. This, an anonymous few lines, probably from the mid-18th century. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Here, if anywhere, is the prototype for Coleridge's moment of humble trust early in the pains of sleep. Tetrameters, these from the prayer, and a to-and-fro movement between iambic, tempet, between iambic tetrameters, the second and the fourth lines, and trochaic tetrameters, the first and the third. It seems to create a gentle rocking of contrastic rhythmic patterns in which the trochaic lines establish the state of vulnerability, sleep, and the possibility of death in sleep, only to be countered in the iambic lines by God's protection with its iambic sureness of pace. Not that any of this is intended by whoever wrote the lines or indeed apprehended in these terms in anything like them, 
by the thousands upon thousands of children who have learned and said the lines. But it may describe the means involved in a real effect, the contrast between danger and safety. The movement is the same as that of Coleridge's concluding couplet. That couplet is an ending, certainly, but it also seems slightly to change the subject, from the protracted self-horrors of what has come before to a plea for love. And in order to give that plea weight, there is the simplest possible protestation of good faith in the poem's last line. But will this help? Is it effectively just saying the one thing twice, with no means of proof? For nothing that has come before in the poem offers any corroborating evidence. To be loved is all I need, and whom I love, I love indeed. Perhaps the answer is in the metre. For this poem's single trochaic tetrameter, one line alone out of 52 is, to be loved is all I need. There's effort involved in getting that stress on the first syllable, but for the pattern to work, the effort just has to be made. To be loved is all I need. Sounded that way, the strain of the voice in the meter is audible. It's uncomfortable, uncomforted, unconsoled. Only a return to the iambic pulse can set it right, in the hope that what the regular rhythm carries, like the rhyme it smoothly delivers, can bring the wanted consolation. And whom I love, I love indeed. Tautology, saying the same thing twice, can ride on regularity in the rhythm of a poem, as perhaps a nightmare can be soothed and banished by the measure of a lullaby. Finally, of course, we may doubt that here. This is Coleridge, after all, and the nightmares have had the best of it in the rest of the poem. But we can hardly doubt the intent or the hope of what we're hearing at the end and in the end. The Pains of Sleep Ere on my bed my limbs I lay, it hath not been my use to pray with moving lips or bended knees. But silently, by slow degrees, my spirit I to love compose, In humble trust mine eyelids close, With reverential resignation, No wish conceived, no thought expressed, Only a sense of supplication, A sense o'er all my soul impressed, That I am weak, yet not unblessed, Since in me, round me, everywhere Eternal strength and wisdom are. But yesternight I prayed aloud in anguish and in agony, upstarting from the fiendish crowd of shapes and thoughts that tortured me. A lurid light, a trampling throng, sense of intolerable wrong, and whom I scorn, those only strong. Thirst of revenge, the powerless will still baffled and yet burning still. Desire with loathing strangely mixed on wild or hateful objects fixed. Fantastic passions, maddening brawl, and shape and terror, and shame and terror over all. Deeds to be hid, which were not hid, which all confused, I could not know whether I suffered or I did. For all seemed guilt, remorse or woe, my own or others still the same, Life stifling fear, soul stifling shame. So two nights passed. The night's dismay saddened and stunned the coming day. Sleep, the wide blessing, seemed to me distemper's worst calamity. 
the third night, when my own loud scream had waked me from the fiendish dream, or come with sufferings strange and wild, I wept as I had been a child, and having thus, by tears, subdued my anguish to a milder mood, such punishments, I said, were due to natures deepliest stained with sin, for I, in tempesting anew the unfathomable hell within, the horror of their deeds to view, to know and loathe, yet wish and do. Such griefs with such men well agree, but wherefore, wherefore fall on me? To be loved is all I need, and whom I love, I love indeed.